everybody. Hey. Well, now we are going to get it on. We're going to have a very, very direct talk this afternoon. So a real honor to be here. Um, I just came in from New York. I was up to Columbia, and I love it because I didn't graduate high school. Um, well, I did, I guess, kind of by the seat of my pants. But I love that um, I, I always want to call my mother. And it's like, I told you. I was nearly as dumb as they said I was. Um, but all I did want to do was open a nightclub. And I'll tell you why. Um, a, um, I was 10 um, in 1968 um, when Dr. King was assassinated. And living in LA, we share that in common. And almost, I mean, a little while, my birthday was a week later uh, when uh, Robert Kennedy was assassinated uh, two, uh, two months later. And it was a, it was a, it still, I believe, is, is one of the great wounds in America that has yet to be healed. But I was so intrigued as a young man because I, I, I've always been in, in, intrigued by music, the first language. Because as a young man, well, you know that, that when you become of age and you start to see the world as it is, not as your parents kind of want you to see it, but as it really is. Um, as a 10-year-old, I couldn't figure out why everybody was, was, was fighting and dying and burning over what seemed to be a real basic principle. You know, that if people could move beyond race, beyond gender, beyond um, economics, beyond class, um, beyond generations, imagine what we could achieve together. I couldn't figure it out. But what really intrigued me as a young man was you went to the right party, you put on the right record, everything people talked about and were, were fussing about over here, they danced to over here. So as a young man, the power of music, it's like, dang, you can get a lot of, it, it just seemed like the perfect Trojan horse. You know, you could take ideas that were fearful, that, that made people terrified, but if you could get it under the wire with music. So that's what really intrigued me a lot. And I, I gotta be honest with you, I saw the movie Casablanca as a young man, and that's what really sealed the deal for me because I saw a nightclub that, that offered freedom simultaneously at two levels. You know, when you first see, I saw that movie when I was 12. My, when we moved here from California, I was a little depressed. My mother sat me down. And we watched this movie together. And to see people streaming in, clearly looking for the immediate freedom of a night out, that interested me. Because again, it was the perfect nightclub. Everything about it functioned at a super high level. But right below the surface, as the camera zoomed in, it got really into the intimacy of every conversation. Every single conversation was, how do I get out of Casablanca? To the metaphor, metaphorical freedom of America, right? Freedom of two levels. I was fascinated by the duality of this, that, that the club that everybody saw wasn't the real club. The club was right below the surface, the way out. That's what interested me. So when I was a kid, it was like music, you know, really purposeful music used in a nightclub setting where you could use music, theater, art, dance, satire. Look at what John Stewart does every night with comedy. You know, the power of that. That's what was interesting me. Now, I oftentimes should, I should always start almost every single uh, uh, opportunity to speak with, hello, my name is Robert, and I'm a recovering hypocrite. Because I had spent so much of my youth focused on that nightclub. You know, I, I, I could not wait to get out of, of high school and, and start running nightclubs. That's all I did. I spent most of my 20s. And I was, I was so lucky because not only did I, I go through an amazing era of kind of an explosion of, you know, funk, electronic, um, punk, all kinds of crazy music. But also got to work with jazz clubs. I got to see Sarah Vaughan, Billy Eckstein, um, Mel Torme, Modern Jazz Quartet. So I had a really beautiful spectrum and I was ready to go when I was asked to go outside and, and feed people who sleep outside here in the nation's capital. And I gotta be honest with you, um, I didn't want to do it. I, I, like everybody, I walked by this growing number of people that was very confusing. I mean, there always been people on the fringe, but never people outside behind the White House sleeping out on steam rates around the nation's capital. This is a very new phenomenon in America. And like most people, I wish somebody else would do something about it. But when asked if I'd help, I'd try to get out of it. And long story short, I went out and uh, started serving people on a night very much like tonight. It was a rainy night in Washington. And uh, to, make, to make conversation, I asked where the food came from and found that it was purchased in a local restaurant. I mean, look at a local grocery store. And uh, dude, we gotta finish this up. Thank you. Um, 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 you can teach you. And I can, yeah, there you go. <laughs> you work hard, you work that side of um, But anyway, so I'm thinking, maybe you bought food at the local grocery store, the restaurant I work in throws away food every night. In fact, the entire industry I grew up in throws away a lot of food. It's part of our business culture. And again, it was part of the American culture. Throw it away. It doesn't matter. There's more where that came from, right? 
So I'm thinking that, but then when we pulled up and we started serving people, my, my immediate fear dissipated. You know, my sense of who are the homeless, you know, they're different than me, all that stuff. But I gotta be honest with you, as we were serving people, and you know, we're dutifully doing the lentil soup and then the cookies and the banana and the bread, and everybody's getting something. As it got to the end, I saw people holding all this stuff, walking off into the rainy night. The driver kept calling at them by name. See you tomorrow night. See you tomorrow night. And I kept thinking, see you tomorrow night. What happens between now and then? It's raining outside. I'm going to go home and go to bed. In fact, you know, chances are I could go home and, and, and think, man, I did a good deed. You know, I'm going to little, get a little extra bonus points in heaven for this. Um, but I couldn't stop thinking about the fact that both the people outside on the street and the people in the truck were trapped in this charity model. Now, I came back. I'll be honest with you. All I wanted to do was maybe get the Volunteer of the Year prize. I just came back with a little business plan based on FedEx. That's all it was, FedEx for food. If you get the restaurants, the hotels, the hospitals, the universities, the farmers to donate unserved surplus food and bring it back to a central hub, you could feed more people better food for less money. But more importantly, and this is where it gets interesting, the idea was why don't you offer the men and women on the street the chance to come in and be part of that process? And if they can learn to cook, you can not only you can do all that other stuff, but you can shorten the line by the very way you serve the line. And you can actually repay to the men and women who donated the food, men and women who are ready to show up on time and work. Everybody would win. Now, I proposed this idea to a group of nonprofits that were feed, that were in charge of feeding the poor. No one would do it. Everybody kept telling me all the reasons it wouldn't work. Now, again, I've gone through a long phase, and I'm going to speed up my, my conversation here because I want to give you a sense of the arc of my journey because that's where it started. It started, the kitchen was born out of that frustration, that, that groups I felt who had a moral obligation to do anything they could to liberate people were so addicted, and I, they weren't bad people. I've, 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 learned, I've, I've learned to understand it wasn't the players, it's the game. But the point is, they were so wrapped up in their machine, they couldn't let it go. Even when offered an alternative. Again, I didn't want to do this, but it was one of those points, and I think most of you all in this room have already made this decision. If there's any young person in the audience, any young, older person, it's always amazing sometimes the road splits. You wake up one morning and think everything's going just the way you planned it, and all of a sudden the road splits and you have to make a choice in your life. And this is one of those for me where it was clear that nobody was going to do this idea, and I just felt like it had to be done. It was that it would have been wrong for this to have just kind of been chalked it up to, well, they're, they're no good, it should have happened, but it's, there, it's on them. So I started the kitchen, it's been 23 years. And we're about to graduate our 83rd class of men and women um, on Friday. Now, so it's all good. And, and, and let, me, let me build this up a little bit because what's important to get is, you know, every day we do 5,000 meals. Every year we buy about $300,000 worth of local produce. Every year the men and women who graduate from our job training program, the majority of whom are felons. And of course, we started with alcohol and heroin. Then came crack. In 1996, we had welfare reform. Now it's felons. Our attitude is whoever's at the bottom is who we serve. And we've, we've, we've dedicated ourselves to flexibility, always trying to fit our program to the people we're serving, not the other way around. You know, we've pioneered um, living wages for staff. We started everybody at 13, with 13,000, I'm sorry, $13 an hour with full benefits, uh, $10,000 benefit package. Um, we have a volunteer bill of rights to codify our transparency and our commitment to transparency. Um, every year our graduates, <coughs> will earn $2 million in salaries and pay $217,000 in payroll taxes into the district treasury. All these things we do, um, we are, by any measure, an extremely powerful, um, self-sufficient. We earn 50% of our own money, nonprofit. But at the end of the day, I was doing a speech a couple of weeks ago, and somebody, it was a, it was a Dr. King anniversary, and somebody said, Dr. King would probably admire your work. And I said, actually, I think Dr. King would recoil at my work. Because Dr. King wasn't coming to Washington to lead the Poor People's Campaign for free food from restaurants. He was coming here to talk about economic empowerment. You know, now the real deal is, I love the DC Central Kitchen, but there's two things. A, the food that we get is lost profit. Restaurants bought that food, they gave it to us because they couldn't sell it. Business 101 in America, they're gonna figure it out. Every year, less food comes in. And 10,000 people a day turn 60 in America, in a society that treats its elders shamefully. And there's already a waiting list in America, and half our American cities for Meals on Wheels, and there's 80 million people getting old. So at one level, you've got less food coming in, and we're not talking about just the DC Central Kitchen, we're talking about every food bank, 
every pantry in America, less food, more hungry people. So at one level, no matter how ferocious I make the DC Central Kitchen, it can never meet the need. Second, and this is more profound, and this is something that I wish all of us would do sometimes, at the end of the day, if you had to pick a face of who's hungry in America, a snapshot, many people would say it's a child. And unfortunately, too many of my brothers and sisters move it, and I say this with love in my heart, exploit childhood hunger as a fundraising gimmick. You know, my attitude is all hunger's wrong, period, all the time. Never divide your forces. When you divide, you become weaker. You know, so again, we've got, it's not a child. And unfortunately, it's probably not a senior, though we don't know how many seniors are hungry in America because no one's really looked at it. And the reality is, is the prideful generation out there now, generation of men and women who wouldn't tell you if they were hungry even if they were. But the real face of hunger is probably a single mom with kids doing everything right. Everything our country's asked her to do. She's been through job training programs. She's got a little job. She's got two jobs. She's saving her money, but I don't, and I think we all know this, 10, 11, 12, 13, maybe even 14 an hour, still is not gonna make it to the end of the month. Now the reality is, I love the DC Center Kitchen. I've worked hard to make it a bad-ass machine of love. But at the end of the day, I don't wanna live in a country where we think the solution is feeding a working woman leftover food from a restaurant. It's only the beginning. The kitchen, and this is where I think we've gotten lost. Because I think we've gotten lost in thinking if I could just build a bigger kitchen, I could feed more people. No, wrong direction. It's like saying if we could just build more prisons, we wouldn't have a crime issue in America. It's the exact same thing we're doing in the nonprofit sector. We keep thinking if we just build bigger, 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 it's different. And I'll be honest with you, the book I wrote, and some of you may want to breeze through while you're going to get it right now, um, I was, a, I, I was a, a frustrated young man. Um, it was written a couple of years ago, and I took a momentary turn as the, the head of the United Way in the National Capital Area. It was on fire, and no one else would do it, to be quite honest with you. But I was, I was transfixed because I thought this was this golden opportunity. This thing was making, this was a $90 million a year operation. And my assumption was that, I, that, that if they were dumb enough to let a nonprofit person in charge, put, be in charge of $90 million, I'd take it. Because I was hoping that I would turn around and every single nonprofit in town who complained about how dumb foundations were and how smart they'd be if they had the money, that they'd be there to help. That they'd see this was our magic moment, this time where we could stand together and rebuild something that wasn't necessarily built around charity, but was transitioning to an empowerment, a liberating force. When I turned around, there was nobody there. The nonprofits had run, all scattered, trying to keep their own little ship afloat. And they all said, well, we wish you luck, Robert. Man, you know, you are the man of man. You're the one taking Oh, man, we wish you luck, but I can't help you. I'm busy keeping my thing going. It really, I'll be honest with you, took a lot of wind out of my sails because I love this city, and I love my colleagues, and I just couldn't believe that they weren't, they didn't see the opportunity we had. Now, I'll be honest with you, I took a little powder. Sometimes when you're, when, when you're a little bit dejected, you don't want to cross that line where you can't return. I decided I'd take a little break, and I went to India because I wanted to study the Indian National Congress. I had read that the British never, ever had more than, than 2,000 officers stationed in India. And I really stepped back, because I, I didn't study that hard in school, so for me to read a footnote was a pretty big deal. <laughs> but I tell you, um, that one, I don't know why I picked that one, because it really changed my entire life in a way, because it just, it, it transfixed me the notion that 2,000 white men could dominate 350 million people on an entire subcontinent for a century and a half. Now, I, I had to figure out how they did this, and I'll be honest with you, I thought it was going to be some kind of a Da Vinci Code kind of thing, you know? Because I couldn't figure out how they, you know, my father was in the service, so I understand command structure, but I could not for the life of me. But it, embarrassing as it sounds, I allowed myself 30 days. A day and a half in, I figured it out. And it was right in my face. I couldn't be more obvious. I went to Nehru's home, which had been converted into a library study center. And it became very obvious very quick that as long as the British could divide Indians by race, caste, class, geography, language, and keep them fighting each other, it was a piece of cake. See it in the bar, Reds will have a gin and tonic. You know, and it dawned on me that very moment. I laughed out loud because I thought, oh my goodness, that's the nonprofit sector in America. That's us. Fighting each other for crumbs from the table. You know, in actuality, the nonprofit sector in America, you pull us together. Now again, universities. Hospitals, Smithsonian Institute, your programs, my programs, you pull them together, economically, we're bigger than India. If the nonprofit sector in America was a country, we'd be, we'd, most, we'd be the seventh biggest economy in the planet. We might have a permanent seat on the UN Security Council if we were a country. 
yet we don't have a say in the smallest town's budget process. We've been trained and we accept the notion that our role is to sit outside City Hall and wait till the decisions get made. And then we have our little protests, hey, hey, ho, ho, fill in the blank, it's gotta go. You know, and, and we do this dutifully. The reality is, like any liberation movement, oftentimes the keys to the shackles are right in front of you all along. That's what interests me. You know, nonprofits in this town, we represent, you know, if we pull, if we, I, one of my favorite subjects, you know, every once in a while when I do these talks, somebody will bring up the subject of mergers. Isn't it time for more nonprofits to merge? Yeah, of course, we can talk about that. It's always a legitimate discussion. We all know there's duplication. But let's take it up a few notches. You know, most people here, when they hear mergers, they think two become one. And again, that's a legitimate exercise. But take it up one more level. Maybe it's four groups sharing backroom services. You know, maybe again, it's HR department. It's the accounting department. Take it up one more level. Maybe it's a whole bunch of people putting a little money in and hiring an advocate that's at City Hall every single day representing our shared interests. Take it up one more notch. We pool our banking business, not our money, but our banking business. You go back to your town, whether it's LA, whether it's Pittsburgh, whether it's uh, uh, Fort Wayne, whether wherever you're from, you go back and you get the 10 or 20 biggest nonprofits and you merge your banking business, then you go to all the banks and says, who wants our collective business? But you know what? We want a seat on the board of directors. We want access to capital. No more grants. We want access to money. We want the same opportunities that business has. And that's really where I come in. Because I'll tell you, I came back from India hell-bent on uniting the nonprofit sector and was proud to be the co-convener of the first ever nonprofit Congress in 2006. And the idea was simple. The nonprofit sector was burdened by the notion that we don't have anything in common. That again, what does the university and the soup kitchen have in common? Oftentimes we have split political views. Well, obviously there's three things we have in common. One, we get no media, no analysis. Again, one-tenth of the American economy, one-tenth, you know, 14 million employees and no in-depth analysis on a daily basis. So that if you're gonna give one of those people who give over $300 billion a year to charity, there's no access to information about what's a good nonprofit. In fact, if you walked out here right on the street, right out in front, one of the most educated cities in the planet, and stopped 10 of the smartest looking people walking down the street and said, what's a good nonprofit? Seven wouldn't even try and answer. Two would look like they knew but didn't want to be wrong, so they kept it quiet. One would say, oh, man, it's easy. That's the one, it's the one with the lowest administrative overhead. Everybody would not. Now, again, think about that. One-tenth of the American economy, and that's the depth of knowledge. That's how we define a good nonprofit. That's absurd. And that's the second thing we have in common. We are all burdened by the, by the intellectual tar, the, the yoke around our neck that insists that we can't pay good wages, that we can't attract a younger generation, we can't do research and development, we can't advertise, we can't be political. And speaking of political, that's the third thing we have in common. And this is the most germane to our conversation, our meeting today. Legislation is being passed, not just here in Washington, D.C., but in every single American city that is based on an antidotal understanding of what we do. You know, if you ask the average legislator, and I, I gotta say, preface this really quickly, because you're gonna meet a lot of people, and it's tempting sometimes to see people in terms of good, bad, you know, smart, dumb. But the reality is most elected officials are, are tied up in knots trying to figure out, they, they, I can't imagine sleeping at night being an elected official. You know, for decades you got to give it away. They got to take it all back now. It's got to be a hard job. But they're burdened by the notion, if you ask them if you have a dry cleaner and a domestic violence shelter, which one's more important to the economic longevity of your town right now? Well, they're going to instinctively say, well, it's the business. You know, it's a dot com. Well, the reality is, it's most likely the domestic violence shelter. Now, first and foremost, the shelter hasn't done its best to um, enunciate or to really play out its economic role. But that lack of understanding, this, this avalanche of, of, of um, legislation that is, seems smart in the short term is going to really hurt our country. And I know that's why you all are here, because you understand the impact, not just on the poor, but I tell you, when I was in India, one of the things that I really came across that inspired me so much was Gandhi once said the oppressed and the oppressor are equally afflicted. So much of the work we do is about the oppressed. I want to heal the oppressor. That's what interests me. That's one of the reasons we do a lot of businesses. You know, we have, as you, I mentioned earlier, we have a significant number of felons on our staff. We, uh, we just added 40 new jobs uh, over the summer because we're doing one of the more interesting experiments. We're doing locally sourced cooked from scratch meals for DC public schools right now. And for the most part, although not on site, the majority of the work is being done by felons. 
Um, I'm a big believer in this. Now, what I'm interested in is trying to help people over this, this big hump. I was listening to the other session, and they were talking a little bit about fear. And I, I'm intrigued by fear. Because again, I went through a phase of being frustrated by nonprofits, and I've come to understand, again, as I said earlier, it's really not the players, it's the game. They've been burdened by the roots of modern philanthropy, which was my mother's generation, white women who came out of the home in the 1970s. My mother was one of them. And I'm gonna do just a little history here, because I think this is fascinating. But up until World War II, men and women were almost equal in higher education. When World War II ended for the first time in the history of the world, an army came home and didn't go back to the farm. Never happened before. So that, that we said, in effect, to women, and again, primarily white women, you have to step aside to make room for these men who would normally have gone back to the farm. My mother was one of those first generation of women who went back to school in the 1950s. Now she married my father and moved out to the suburbs, because again, as that farmland got sold because the sons didn't come back home, suburbs grew up. And my mother watched civil rights, the women's movement, um, environmental movement, and in the 1970s, proud mother, proud wife, but it was her time. And like thousands of her sisters, she went out looking for work and was told, you don't have any skills. You're a mother, you're a wife, go do charity. And that is the explosion. This charity, you know, was only about 60,000 nonprofits in 19, uh, 1968. We went to a million and a half in 15 years. And I always, I, that, 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 real, that mathematics really puzzled me until I was at my mother's funeral, I was doing a eulogy, my father, in talking to me about it, said, you know, your mother was the CEO of a major company, our family. You know, man, she paid all the bills. She bought the car, she bought the home. My father was in Vietnam three times. She started a soccer league. She did all this work, yet when she came out and wanted to prove herself in the business world, she was told you don't have the skills to compete. And the sector was exploded because we forced that generation of women. And with that came the gender roles of .com.org. And that is what has burdened us for the longest time. This, make no mistake, this is viewed by the majority of people in America as women's work. Nice, but not necessary. And we have to own, we have to be respectful of the founding mothers. They had, the, they had their own internal boundaries, but they had external forces that were not gonna let them go much further. Make no mistake, when they went out to the foundation world, money made by white men given away by other white men, you know, they were told in effect, you wanna feed poor people leftover food from a restaurant, more power to you. You want to plant some flowers, you know, heal this, you know, be nice to the sick and the elderly and, and all that stuff, that's fine. No politics, no economics. You know, benign charity. And that system, no matter how big we make it, it's not designed to work. So what we have to do and commit to is working together to free this sector. This was supposed to be a liberating army. I grew up thinking that that music. Rock and soul music and nonprofits were both lethal, lethal um, machines of liberation. And both got hijacked. One got sold back as good deeds, the other as entertainment. And I'm a big believer that we have enormous power, enormous power. And that's what I spent years trying to work on. And it's been a very, very difficult road because I've got to be honest with you, they'll love you all day long. If I sit over in that shelter, and we're right across the street here. You can come over there any day you want. We're there seven days a week. As long as I sit over there and feed the poor, I mean, they'll give me medals and prizes and say all kinds of nice things about me. But I mean, the second you start talking about politics in this town, man, you're a troublemaker. Well, we need an army of troublemakers. And I'm looking at them right here in this room. Don't tell me you all are troublemakers. So it's, a, it's a sophisticated kind of trouble I'm looking for. You know, again, we have tremendous power to work with. Um, but make no mistake, anybody here from New York? New York, I was just up in New York. Now, you realize nonprofits in that state represent 17% of the workforce. 17% of the workforce. Yet there was a governor's race last year, and in fact, there were 36 governor's races. And I gotta be honest, shame on us. We missed 08. I worked so hard up in New Hampshire. 08 was the first election in 80 years where there's no incumbent in the presidential race, which meant that it was a horse race. And we had so many opportunities, and, and the, the, the idea behind what became this V3 campaign, which was uh, standing for the voice, the value, and the votes of the nonprofit sector, was to start to say, nobody gets elected in this country unless they can part, they have detailed plans for how they will channel the energy of the nonprofit sector in America, period. Now again, this isn't because I work in a nonprofit, man, this is business 101. You know, if you're a candidate, and again, I want to go back to New York State, Here's a state that was not $1 billion in the hole two years ago. They are $9 billion. 
and they're gonna be $14 billion next year. And there were two men who wanted to be the governor, yet not ne neither one of those candidates in any of their materials talked about how they would utilize the energy of 14% of their workforce, how they would channel the energy of tens of thousands, if not millions of volunteers. And I really wanna point out something really important here because you wanna talk about an army that's waiting right now. I love speaking, I, I, I'm real lucky. I, I didn't go to college, but I'm an I'm a, I'm a honorary degree. Well, I'm a doctor four times over now. I've got so many honorary degrees from speaking at colleges. But you know, um, last year I spoke and I got a call from someone saying, uh, from CNN, I was gonna be filmed as part of a crew of people that were gonna be filmed on, on doing commencement speeches. And somebody said, man, Robert, the work you do, you've gotta be prepared to talk to those students about the, the essential need to give back. And I was like, man, I gotta tell you, anybody who asks this current generation to give back doesn't have a clue about this generation. My generation gave back. The DC Central Kitchen is based on giving back. Because that you know what we do now in America is like I've eaten all I can eat. I can't eat another bite. Take what I didn't eat and feed the poor. That's giving back. That's not supposed to work. It's not bad, not in the slightest, but it's not gonna work. This generation has a very different attitude. Now I want to really make this clear. What we're looking at is a generation almost 75 million strong. There are 75 young men and women, 75 million young men and women below the age of 30 out there. The most diverse generation in the history of America raised doing service. 90% of every single freshman class has done service. The ability with those little handheld crackberries and iPhones to communicate globally with the push of a button. And dare I say, almost a global language with hip hop. And what you saw in Egypt is just the beginning. This is an army, they are poor, they are plugged in and they are pissed off and they are coming. You know, and they're, they are an army of people, but make no mistake, they're not interested in charity. They want to be part of an empowerment movement. You know, when I was a young man, I'd take my old boots down to the, to the store, you know, and they'd say, buy a new pair, and we'll give your old pair of boots to a poor person. They buy Tom's shoes. Saying, in effect, somebody gets the exact same pair of shoes they got. They are driving on campuses, whether it's fair trade, whether it's green policies, whether it's paying the workers a good wage, this younger generation is driving a very different discussion. And again, they will not have the money to give to us. This is a huge imperative. Make no mistake, the machine we built with love in our hearts, the charity machine in America, it's been built on the extra of this country. I use extra food. Some of us use extra buildings. We use the extra time of volunteers and make no mistake, all we get is the extra money. The era of extra is ending. And we will wither unless we change our model. But this is an important time. Again, I was a very lucky young man, as I told you. Part of the Central Kitchen business model is based on, I was lucky enough to see James Brown perform on numerous occasions. But when I was a young man, there was a song that struck me so hard, which is, I don't want nobody to give me nothing. Just open the door, I'll get it myself. And that's the Kitchen's motto. That is what we do. And that's all, make no mistake, we cannot fix anything on our own. But baby, we can crack the door. You know, we can lead people lead people to new truths. That's all I try and do with the DC Central Kitchen, just lead people to the truth. You know, and, and we have a thing we call the calculated epiphany. 14,000 people come through every year volunteering. You know, and the kitchen, most of those people can't wait. They're thinking they're gonna get to serve the poor. And it's like, oh no baby, we don't do that here. We're, this is a we thing. Everybody comes around, that's the big experiment at the kitchen. You know, Bill Clinton was one of the smartest presidents we ever had, next to our current president. A man didn't know how to cut a carrot. He came down to the D.C. Central Kitchen volunteer. A man in a drug treatment program taught the President of the United States how to cut a carrot. That's what we do at the D.C. Central Kitchen. Whether you are the President of the United States or whether you're a resident of the shelter at 2nd and D, we both live in the same city. We have a shared responsibility and a shared opportunity. What we do is just reveal what was there all along. Every single thing we use at the kitchen was already there. We take food our society threw away, people our society undervalued. A kitchen that was empty, volunteers who wanted to be part of something powerful, chefs who had food but had jobs, agencies that, that were buying food when they really wanted to use their shrinking budgets to liberate people. All that was there. I get way too much credit. All I did was come around and move existing ingredients around and put them in a different order. But that's what a good nonprofit do. It reveals how rich our communities truly are. But the real riches will be exposed is the men and women, again, now I wanna go back to fear for a second because most people in America, honestly, are incredibly kind people. Again, they volunteer in record numbers, cracking almost 100 million. 
And again, $300 billion a year goes to charity. But most people would rather think that if you're poor, it's your fault. If you're in prison, you deserve it. If you're hungry, you're lazy. And they're not bad people, that's just safe. Everybody holds on close to what keeps them safe. You know, it's our job, and if you think about it, programs like yours and programs like I don't know how many times, and how many different programs I've worked with, and we have gotten really good collectively at helping men and women who've coming out of addiction, you know, men and women coming out of prison, to take a big step, a big step. You know, and I'm interested in how can we turn that around and help American society take an equally big step. And that's what interests me, because I tell you, some of the things that we're trying to reveal, um, I'll be honest with you, I think the future, the future of philanthropy is going to be how you spend your money every day. That's what, that's what made Dr. King so dangerous. You know, think about it. You know, if you look at Mahatma Gandhi, or Dr. King, or Cesar Chavez, you know what they all three proved? Dr. King used the dimes it took to ride a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi took plain, simple table salt. Cesar Chavez took grapes. And he said, if we don't buy salt, table salt, the British, or the British crown's going to have to come to the negotiating table. If we don't ride the bus together in Montgomery, Alabama, racism in America will have to be addressed. If we don't buy table grapes, landowners in California will have to give us basic rights. These were things that had been insurmountable walls. And the notion that you could begin to crumble those walls with grapes, dimes, and salt, but what they proved, that is if the poorest people in the community don't buy grapes, don't buy salt, don't ride the bus, the machine stops. The illusion of power is revealed. And what is revealed is the power of daily commerce, poor people's pennies. That's what we can reveal. That's what the social enterprise movement is about. This idea that in the future, commerce, everyday commerce, will be the only sustainable philanthropy. That's what interests me. Right now, charity in America is based on the redemption of the giver, not the liberation of the receiver. That's its flaw. And we have to flip that around. Just flip it around. And it's not nearly as hard as people would make it out. Because again, you've got an army coming up, a young generation, and I tell you, I hate to generalize, but what you can see coming a mile away is a generation that wants to merge their spirituality, their lifestyle, and their income. Saying, in effect, look, man, i got to make some money. I can't work for nothing. But uh, if I can find a way to make a living in which I know and don't do harm, I do good, sign me up. And that's an army of people who are looking for a way in which the way they make their money can be their philanthropy. The way they, the way they pay their staff can be their vote. But at the same time, and I think this is also equally powerful, every single morning, if I didn't say it earlier, 10,000 people have turned 60 in America. I say this just about every time I speak. It's a wonder you can't walk outside and put your head out the window in the morning and hear a sigh. You know, as, as 10,000 people look in the mirror and say, you know what, man? I heard Dr. King with my own ears. You know, I heard, I heard Marvin Gaye or John Lennon, you know, or Robert Kennedy with my own ears. How did I get so lost? How did I, how did I get fooled into thinking if I just bought more junk, I'd be happy? You know, and they're looking in the mirror and they're just seeing, uh, there's this hole here, and they're coming. I see them every day. Thousands of people, annual, older people saying, use me. This will be the deepest well of life experience in the history of the world. The history of the world. You know, the, the, the amazing waters that are right there. So when you've got two generations, one, in a sense, looking for redemption. Another generation looking for a very, very different way to make their living. And again, to, to, to kind of have this full, connected life. Those two groups are careening towards us. We're in the middle. Right where they cross is the nonprofit sector in America. Now again, if all we do is say, give us some money, or hey, volunteer, come down here and help us paint the shelter for the 58th time, shame on us. But if we realize that opportunity, there is more economic and political power there than anybody's seen in a 1,000 years. This is a thing that can turn the whole equation around. But it's going to be based in this idea that, again, how you spend your money every day you can do more. We can do more. Right now, if we said, for example, if you look at the, and then I'll, then I'll close up and we'll open it up. Um, but I'm really interested in wage. If you get down to brass tacks, the majority of what we do in human service work is about wage. You know, it's, it's women working who can't make enough, plain and simple. Now, I watched Ted Kennedy, God rest his soul, for 20 years fight for an increase in minimum wage. 20 years worth of work, and you know what the minimum wage is now? 
seven something. 20 years worth of work, and it's still just seven dollars. Now, do we want to spend another 20 years? And I got to tell you, do you know what's lined up there waiting for us on that fight? I never want to fight up on that hill. And again, what Dr. King and Gandhi proved is the power isn't really there at all. That's where the illusion of power is. The power is out there. You know, if we can convince people that you got to keep every dime, no matter what town you live in, the essential economic thing is keep the money local. So again, when you come, when you have a choice right now, our catering company, this is what we pitch. As long as our product is a great product and the service is great, then you got choices. When you buy our product, you're getting men and women who used to go back to prison working and paying, paying, wait, uh, paying taxes. You're supporting a local farmer. All the money we make goes back to a job training program which seeds the city, you know, literally a million and a half meals for free and also buys from local farmers. You know, what we're trying to say is, look, you have this opportunity, one purchase, one lunch, one catered event, and you can be part of a liberating army. And that's what we can do. You know, and it's not just programs at the kitchen. Any, I, I gotta be honest with you, any single business that pays a good wage, gives people the day off to vote, offers health care, man, they're a social enterprise too. But there's two or three things I'd really suggest when you go back. Make the day in which we sat on the sidelines politically has to end. We must become engaged politically. And we must see beyond these little tiny fractured lines. We need to realize that, um, I'm sorry, what's your name, my friend? Wayne. Wayne. Wayne and I both live in D.C. If Wayne and I on North Capitol Street both had dry cleaners right across the street, and every morning I'd wake, I'd, I'd rush down every day, fingers crossed, hoping Wayne's dry cleaner burned down last night. You know, I, I hate Wayne. I can't. I, I just I wish Wayne all kinds of ill. But the reality is, somebody comes in town wants to regulate small business. Wayne and I are down at the Chamber of Commerce together. You know, we need a Chamber of Commerce mentality for the for nonprofits in America. We need to own our power and speak collectively, not all the time. There will be times when it's going to be important for arts groups or environmental groups to speak about their specific issue, but there are pivotal moments, and those pivotal moments are when you elect leadership. What we need is what you see now very quickly in Connecticut. Um, the new governor there has a new uh, a, a cabinet-level position, somebody's job it is to work with nonprofits. And we need that in every single state house and I believe every single city hall. You know, if you really, you know what no one's ever done in America, ever, is if you took any of the cities you're from and you actually figured out how much money, nonprofits, how much money we bring in from outside the city or outside the state, what would be revealed is we're probably the, one of the biggest sources of investment in every single town. Now, a smart mayor will recognize that and partner with us to double that investment coming in. There's so many different ways we can do good business, but again, it starts with one powerful step, and that's the bravery it takes to let go of the, of the survival of your individual organization and realize this is an all votes must rise moment for the nonprofit sector of America. America. We are, we can't fix anything, but man oh man can we lead people to the promised land. Thank you all very, very much.